I sit in my cramped office cubicle, staring at the glowing computer screen in front of me. Numbers and formulas fill my vision, one spreadsheet blurring into the next. My phone buzzes for the umpteenth time today, another email that demands immediate attention. The stress is piling up, and I can feel a headache forming at the base of my skull. The office is loud today, people chatting, printers whirring, phones ringing, and all I want is silence. Finally, I reach a breaking point. I minimize the spreadsheet, open a new tab, and type in secluded cabin rentals near me. I scroll through the options. Most are too fancy, boasting Wi-Fi and hot tubs, things I don't need or want right now. I want isolation, not luxury. Then I find it, a rustic one-room cabin set deep in the woods. No amenities, no distractions. Perfect. I book it for a week, starting tomorrow. A spontaneous decision, but necessary. I rush home after work, throwing clothes and essentials into a duffel bag. I hit the grocery store next, stocking up on simple foods that don't require much cooking. Canned beans, rice, fresh vegetables, and a steak for the first night. No reason I can't treat myself a little after all. I go to bed early, setting my alarm for an ungodly hour. The cabin is a few hours' drive away, and I want to get an early start. The next morning, I'm on the road before the sun rises. The journey is peaceful, each mile taking me further away from my daily responsibilities and headaches. The sunlight filters through the trees, casting a dappled pattern on the road ahead. I roll down the window and inhale deeply, taking in the crisp, fresh air that my city apartment can never offer. My phone loses its signal, and I feel a strange mixture of anxiety and relief. The absence of emails, calls, and endless notifications is jarring, but it's exactly what I came here for. I glance at my printed directions just to confirm, realizing I'm completely off the grid now. As I make the final turn indicated on my instructions, I start to see a clearing up ahead. The forest gives way to a small open area, and there it is, the cabin I've rented for the week. It sits alone in the clearing, surrounded by tall grass and wildflowers. It's a simple structure, built of logs and featuring a single chimney. A small porch with a couple of rocking chairs completes the picture. No neighboring cabins, no roads leading elsewhere. It's just me and the solitude I so desperately need. A smile crosses my face for the first time in weeks. Beside the cabin, a small fire pit is ringed with stones, looking as though it hasn't been used in a while. Further away, I see a wooden dock extending into a still pond. The water reflects the sky and trees, disturbed only by the occasional ripple of a fish swimming below the surface. A canoe leans against a tree near the water, worn but sturdy. I pull into the makeshift driveway, a simple dirt patch next to the cabin, and turn off the engine. For a moment, I just sit there, taking it all in. I'm really doing this, spending a week cut off from the world in a cabin in the woods. With a sigh that's part relief and part trepidation, I unbuckle my seatbelt. My normal life feels both incredibly distant and uncomfortably close as I prepare to step out and begin my week of isolation. I unload my car and take a deep breath of the fresh, clean air. This is exactly what I need. I unlock the door to the cabin, pushing it open to reveal the space where I'll be spending the next week. The immediate smell is a mix of old wood from the walls and floor, accompanied by a faint hint of mildew. These scents confirm that this place is as rustic as advertised, which is exactly what I need right now. I step inside and take a deep, cleansing breath. The absence of city noise is refreshing, and the mental image of endless spreadsheets and email chains starts to fade. All that exists for me now is this cabin and the surrounding wilderness. Surveying the interior, I see a small kitchenette to my left, equipped with a sink, a mini-fridge, and a couple of cabinets. There's a single bedroom adjacent to it, which I assume contains just the basics, a bed and maybe a dresser. On my right is a living area furnished with a worn but comfortable-looking couch, a coffee table, 
and a stone fireplace. What's absent are a TV and any Wi-Fi router. This lack of modern distractions is a blessing, confirming that my time here will be spent detached from the digital world. Eager to settle in, I begin to unpack my bags. Opening the fridge, I place my perishables inside. The steak that I had planned for tonight's dinner is the first thing I put in. After all the food is stored, I turn my attention to the fireplace. I gather some kindling and logs from the stack next to it, positioning them as best as I can remember from a childhood Boy Scout trip. Striking a match, I attempt to get a fire going. It's a humbling experience, taking me longer than I'd like to admit. But after some persistence, I hear the satisfying sound of wood crackling and watch as the flames begin to dance. Feeling a sense of accomplishment, I decide it's time to tackle dinner. I grab the steak from the fridge and place it on a cast iron skillet. A sprinkle of salt and pepper is all I use for seasoning. Why complicate things? The steak sizzles as it meets the hot surface, and I flip it a couple of times until it's cooked to what I judge as medium rare. Finally, it's time to eat. I take the skillet off the fire and, using a fork, cut a piece of the steak. I eat it right out of the pan. No point in making more dishes than necessary. It's a simple meal, yet it feels like one of the most rewarding I've had in months. After my satisfying meal, I'm eager to dive into the book that's been collecting dust on my bedside table for months. I reach into my backpack and pull out the worn paperback. The lantern on the table casts its warm yellow glow over the pages as I open to the first chapter. The light flickers slightly, making the words dance. I start to read, getting lost in the story that unfolds. There's something comforting about the tactile sensation of flipping through actual pages. My fingers appreciate the break from incessantly tapping on a keyboard or scrolling on a smartphone. My eyes start to feel heavy, and I let out a long, drawn-out yawn. The fatigue from a grueling work week is finally catching up to me, pulling me towards sleep. Setting the book aside on the coffee table, I stand and reach for the lantern's knob to extinguish the flame. The darkness that follows feels immediate and thick, broken only by the flickering light from the fireplace. I stretch my arms above my head and hear the audible pops from my wrists and shoulders like they're voicing their complaints about the sudden movement. Just as I'm about to use the fire tongs to rearrange the burning logs for the night, a scratching sound reaches my ears. It comes from below, emanating from underneath the wooden floorboards. The noise is low but clear. Scratch. 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 There's no consistent rhythm to it, but the sound persists. My heart rate involuntarily quickens. My eyes dart to the fireplace poker leaning against the hearth. It's solid iron with a sharp point, potentially a weapon if it comes to that. I try to rationalize the sound. Could be a raccoon or maybe a squirrel, I mutter, attempting to assure myself. They sometimes find their way under buildings like this. But even as I say it, the scratching grows in volume, as if challenging my flimsy explanation. The noise starts to dominate the cabin's ambiance, drowning out the crackling of the fire and the night sounds from outside. Despite my rational mind telling me it could be nothing, the thought that it might be something more starts to take hold. Ignoring it would be the easiest course of action, but curiosity grips me tightly. I can't just let it go. I have to know what's down there. The scratching continues, now impossible to ignore. It becomes clear that I won't be able to rest until I've investigated the mysterious noise. Earlier, when I first walked into the cabin, I had noticed a rug tucked away in the corner of the room. At that time, it seemed like just another piece of decor. Now, I recall its presence and walk over to investigate, suspecting it might conceal access to the space below the floor. With a mixture of reluctance and determination, I grip the edge of the rug and pull it aside, revealing a wooden trap door underneath. The door has a rusty handle that seems to have been unused for a while. I pause and take a moment to weigh my options. Do I really want to know what's down there? The ongoing scratching sound answers the question for me. It's as though whatever is making the noise is insisting on being discovered. 
my attention shifts back to the fireplace poker leaning against the hearth. With a cautious step, I walk over, pick up the poker, and grip it tightly in one hand. Its cold, iron form offers a small degree of reassurance. Returning to the trapdoor, I crouch down and grab the rusty handle with my free hand. I pull, and the hinges groan in a loud complaint, breaking the relative silence of the cabin. The door swings open to reveal an abyss of darkness below, swallowing up the meager light from the dying fireplace. It feels like a gaping mouth, ready to consume whatever dares to enter. My heart pounds against my ribcage like a frantic drum, urging me to either flee or proceed. Taking one last deep breath to steady my shaky nerves, I prepare myself for what's to come. Well, here goes nothing, I think, trying to inject some courage into myself. Grasping the poker more tightly than ever, I lower my foot onto the first rung of the ladder that descends into the darkness. And then, with a mix of fear and a desire for answers, I start my descent into the unknown below. As I descend the creaky ladder, each step I take elicits a groan from the wood, and it feels like it hasn't been used in years. When my feet finally meet the dirt floor, it feels like landing on another planet. The air here is thick with the moisture you'd expect from a place devoid of sunlight. A strong scent of mold and decay permeates the air, assaulting my senses. Switching on the flashlight I'd wisely kept in my pocket, I cast its beam into the murkiness. My feet shift uneasily on the dirt floor, which is uneven and pocked with small holes and indentations. The ground is damp, and I can feel the moisture seeping through the soles of my shoes. The space is punctuated by wooden support beams that look old and somewhat rotted. I hear the slow drip of water in the distance. As I sweep my flashlight around, I notice a rickety wooden table pushed against one wall. The table is cluttered with various items, old newspapers, a corroded pocket watch, and what looks like a rusted set of keys. Each object seems to tell a silent, incomplete story, and I wonder what series of events left them abandoned here. My light then catches the edge of something metallic. Turning, I find an old padlock chest sitting in the corner. Its wood is weathered, and the metal parts are tinged with rust. It exudes a sense of mystery, but also foreboding. What could be so important or dangerous that it needed to be locked away down here? Above me, the ceiling is low and lined with cobwebs, their intricate designs shimmering slightly in the artificial light. The webs are thick and dusty, as though they've been spun by generations of spiders. I have to duck my head slightly to avoid them. The beam of my flashlight comes to rest on a dusty, makeshift bookshelf built into the wall, crowded with an array of diaries and notebooks. Overcoming the knot of fear in my stomach, I find myself reaching for one. The cover is worn, the leather peeling at the corners. I open it carefully, flipping through its yellowed pages. Entry 1 I arrived at the cabin today, and it's exactly what I had been hoping for secluded, rustic, and far away from the city. I cooked dinner on the little stove and took a walk in the woods. There's something about being out here that makes me feel alive, like I can finally breathe without the weight of daily responsibilities suffocating me. But as night fell, things started to feel a bit off. I can't put my finger on it, but there are strange noises coming from beneath the cabin. It's probably just an animal or the wind but it's unsettling. I keep hearing scratches, like claws against wood. I'm writing this by lantern light, and the scratching seems to have stopped for now. Maybe I'm just letting my imagination get the better of me. But there's a nagging feeling in the back of my mind, a little voice telling me that I should check it out. For now, I'll just try to get some sleep. Entry 2. I didn't sleep well last night. The scratching sounds continued and I was plagued by nightmares that I can barely remember, filled with shadowy figures and haunting screams. I woke up several times, drenched in sweat. There's a sense of dread hanging over me that I can't shake off. 
Today, I walked around the cabin, trying to see if I could find any signs of what could be making those noises. Nothing. The woods around the cabin are quiet, almost eerily so. But when I came back, I swear I felt like I was being watched, like eyes were on me but I couldn't see them. I'm really starting to question my decision to come here. I came to find peace, but all I've found is anxiety. I've decided to stay one more night. If things don't improve, I'm packing up and leaving first thing in the morning. Entry 3. I can't take it anymore. The sounds are louder now. They're accompanied by an unbearable feeling that I'm not alone, that something is lurking in the shadows. Every time I try to close my eyes, visions of twisted, deformed faces haunt me. Earlier today, I discovered a trapdoor beneath a rug in the corner of the room. I was tempted to open it, to investigate the source of these sounds and sensations, but fear held me back. What if I uncover something I can't handle? What if the dread I'm feeling is a warning? I've made up my mind. I'm leaving. Whatever is going on here, it's beyond my understanding and far beyond what I came here for. I'm packing my bags and leaving as soon as the sun rises. If you're reading this, take it as a warning. Leave, don't stay here, and don't look beneath the floor. As I finish reading the last entry, a wave of cold realization washes over me. The emotions described in these pages mirror my own. My eyes dart to the last sentence. Don't look beneath the floor. A shiver runs down my spine. My grip tightens around the poker and flashlight, my knuckles turning white. A voice inside my head screams for me to leave, climb back up that ladder, lock the trap door, and get out of this place as fast as I can. Yet part of me is gripped by the curiosity of what happened to them. Beside the diary, my flashlight reveals a stack of old photographs. They're held together by a discolored rubber band that has lost much of its elasticity. I pick up the first photograph, and it shows a family. A mother, father, two kids, and even a dog. They're all standing in front of the cabin, smiling as if they've just discovered a slice of heaven. The cabin in the photo appears inviting, not like the ominous place I'm now standing in. The trees behind them are lush, and the sky is a bright, cheerful blue. The second photograph shows a young couple, arms wrapped around each other, grinning from ear to ear. They are sitting on the porch of the cabin, a picnic table set with a red and white checkered cloth, wine glasses, and a basket. The next photo is of a solo traveler, much like myself. He is holding up a fish he probably caught in a nearby stream, looking proud and content. The photo is a bit dated, from the look of the man's clothes and the quality of the image. I then come across a group of friends, gathered around a campfire, drinks in hand and smiles on their faces. They seem so carefree, so unaware of the fate that might have awaited them. It's the last set of photos that chills me the most. These pictures feature those same people, but they are anything but recognizable. The cheerful family that stood in front of the cabin now appears deformed. The mother's face is elongated, her eyes sunken deep into their sockets, looking more like dark voids than eyes. The father's arms have twisted into something resembling gnarled tree branches, extending in grotesque angles. The children's smiles are replaced by mouthfuls of jagged, sharp teeth jutting out irregularly. Even the dog is altered. Its fur looks spiky, and its eyes glow an unsettling red. The young couple from the second photo is just as disturbing. The man's torso is bloated and misshapen, his skin taking on a grayish hue. The woman's hair appears to have turned into a mass of writhing, snake-like tendrils, framing a face that no longer contains any human warmth. Their arms around each other now look like tangled vines, thick and thorny. The solo traveler holding the fish has changed drastically as well. His legs look fused together, resembling a twisted tree trunk more than human limbs. The fish he was holding seems to have merged with his hand, forming a claw-like appendage. His expression is one of eternal agony. 
The group of friends around the campfire now look like nightmarish caricatures. One has an elongated neck like a serpent, and another has sprouted what seem like wings, but the wings are skeletal and devoid of feathers. Faces are stretched or compressed. Eyes are either too large and bulbous or reduced to mere slits. My grip on the poker tightens involuntarily, my knuckles straining against the skin, turning a ghostly white. I feel the cold metal press into my palm. The photos drop from my hand, landing with a muted thud on the dirt floor. Just as I'm about to return the diaries to their dusty resting place and make for the wooden ladder, an unsettling sound breaks the heavy silence. It's a shuffling noise, soft but distinct. My flashlight's beam trembles as my hand wavers, the light skittering across the uneven floor like a startled animal. I freeze, my ears straining to pick up any hint of what made the sound. Then it comes again, but closer this time, a muted growl that rises from the bowels of the dark room. My muscles tense as if electrified, and my grip on the fireplace poker becomes a white-knuckled clutch. Swiveling around, I direct my flashlight toward the murkier recesses of the basement. And that's when I see them. Indistinct forms lurking in the darkness, their twisted silhouettes eerily resembling the deformed figures in the photographs. I can't make out any facial features in the void, but their eyes are another matter entirely. Those eyes shimmer with an uncanny luminescence, pinning me in their ghastly focus. No, 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 this can't be happening, I find myself muttering, though the words are more an automatic response than a declaration. Whether I'm willing to accept it or not, this nightmare is my current reality. And as my heart thunders in my chest, a voice in my head repeats a single urgent command, Get out, now! My heart is a relentless drum in my chest as I quickly run toward the wooden ladder. Stay back, I shout. The warning is as much for my own benefit as for whatever lurks in the shadows. In response, one of the figures emits a hiss, a sound so unnerving it propels me into immediate action. I leap onto the first rung and begin to ascend the ladder. My movements are more of a scramble than a climb. Adrenaline surges through me, powering my limbs as I skip steps in my haste. Reaching the top, I thrust the trapdoor shut with enough force to make the entire cabin shake. My eyes dart around the room, frantically searching for an object to secure the trapdoor. They lock onto the sofa, a bulky piece of furniture that suddenly seems like my best hope for a makeshift barricade. Summoning a reserve of strength, I shove the sofa across the wooden floor until it sits above the trapdoor. The weight of the furniture settles into place, forming a barrier that I hope will be sufficient to keep the figures confined to the basement. Panting heavily, I double over, hands on my knees, as I try to catch my breath. My gaze remains fixed on the sofa, half expecting the cushions to suddenly bulge upward as those creatures try to force their way through. But nothing of the sort occurs. The room is still. The only sounds are my own labored breathing and the distant crackle of the dying fire. For a moment I consider the improbability of the whole situation. Am I dreaming? Hallucinating, perhaps? But the racing pulse in my temples and the sweat trickling down my back tell me this is no figment of my imagination. I'm in the middle of a nightmare that's all too real. My eyes snap to the journals that are now scattered across the floor. My hands shake as I gather them up and begin flipping through their worn pages. The content is grim but consistent, revealing a horrifying curse that taints not just the cabin but the entire surrounding area. Journal entries document eerie whispers that seem to emanate from the wind itself, the unsettling way the trees appear to close in on the writers, and an ominous change that gradually overtakes anyone who lingers too long. One entry spells it out in stark terms. The longer you stay, the less human you become. It's not just a physical metamorphosis. This curse nibbles away at the core of your being, your very soul. I begin to pace the length of the cabin. My mind zeroes in on my car keys. Where did I last see them? My hands fly through the air, 
flipping cushions and rummaging through bags scattered around the room. It feels like an eternity, but then my fingers finally find them. Just as I start to entertain the idea of escape, a dull thud reverberates from beneath the floor, from under the sofa I had moved to barricade the trap door. They're trying to get through. Time is not on my side. I need to leave, and fast. The realization dawns that if I don't act quickly, I risk undergoing the same transformation as those unfortunate souls in the basement. My decision is clear. There's no time to ponder the hows or whys of this situation. I dart toward the cabin door, throwing it open with an urgency that matches the pounding of my heart. My only focus now is to put as much distance between me and this accursed place as humanly possible. I need to escape before I, too, become something less than human. I grab a bag and begin to toss in the bare essentials, a change of clothes, and some food. While doing this, my eyes are drawn to the small mirror hanging on the cabin wall. My reflection shows something disturbing. My facial features are distorting. A jolt of cold fear runs down my spine. Time is running out. Abandoning the idea of taking anything more, I grab my car keys, my wallet, and a flashlight. I kick open the front door, which swings wildly on its hinges and bangs against the outer wall. The gravel crunches under my feet as I sprint toward my car, parked only a short distance away, but feeling like miles in my heightened state of panic. I fumble with the car keys for a split second before successfully unlocking it. I turn the ignition key. The engine coughs and struggles then falls silent. My heart sinks. I pop open the car hood to confirm my suspicion. The engine wires are a mess. Some are even cleanly cut through. Whoever, or whatever, did this knew what they were doing. The car is useless now. Taking out my phone, I find there's no signal. I'm completely cut off from the world. I'm alone, and escape is not going to be easy. Panic is rising in my chest, but I wrestle it down. I can't afford to lose control. The forest in front of me is a maze of towering trees, but it offers the only path away from whatever horrors are lurking in the cabin. I grasp my flashlight and plunge into the forest. My feet pound against the uneven ground, dodging roots and rocks as I go. Branches whip against my arms and face, leaving shallow cuts, but the pain barely registers. My mind is singularly focused on getting as far away as possible from the entities haunting me. However, I become painfully aware that I'm not alone in this dark forest. The sounds that reach my ears confirm my worst fears. Footsteps that aren't mine, distant growls, and the cracking of branches. They're in pursuit. Despite the risks, I can't resist the urge to know how close they are. Shining my flashlight over my shoulder, the beam cuts through the darkness and reveals intermittent glimpses of what's chasing me. Misshapen silhouettes, mere shadows that dart between the trees, their unnatural speed making my stomach turn. My lungs feel like they're on fire, each breath I take is a ragged gasp, as if the very air has thickened. My legs are heavy, as if weighed down by invisible chains. They're screaming at me to stop, to rest, but that's a luxury I can't afford. If I stop, even for a second, it could mean the end of me. The thought propels me forward, stoking the embers of my dwindling energy. Despite the adrenaline flooding my system, I trip over a protruding root, stumbling forward and almost losing my grip on the flashlight. I tighten my grip on the flashlight and push onward. Time loses its meaning as I continue to run, to flee from the unspeakable terror that seems to be always just a step behind. Every snapped twig and every rustle of leaves elevates my heart rate. It's a loop. Run, listen, and run some more, hoping that I'll find a way out of this forest. My eyes lock onto the clearing in the distance. Hope surges through me. This could be my escape. A road or maybe even a cabin belonging to someone else. With this thought propelling me, I summon every reserve of strength I have left. My legs pump faster, and I burst into the open space, 
my feet finally hitting smooth asphalt. It is a road, and never before has a stretch of tarmac felt so incredible. Although I'm out of the forest, I know the danger isn't over. I glance around frantically, desperate for the sight of a car, a streetlight, or a building, any sign that I'm not entirely alone. Just as I'm losing hope, headlights cut through the darkness in the distance. They grow brighter and bigger, moving my way. Is this my rescue, or just another twist in this never-ending nightmare? There's no time to weigh the options. I start waving my arms in the air, hoping to be seen, to signal to the driver that I need help. The car's brakes screech, and it comes to a sudden stop just a few feet from where I'm standing. My heart is pounding in my chest. I can hardly believe it. The driver lowers the car window and peers out at me, his eyes widening in disbelief and concern. What the hell happened to you? You okay? I find it hard to form coherent sentences, my words stumbling over each other in my haste. No time to explain, I manage to get out, urgency dripping from every syllable. Can you please just get me out of here? Without another word, the driver nods and unlocks the passenger door. I quickly climb inside. As I shut the door and hear the lock click into place, the gravity of my situation begins to really set in. I'm out. I escaped. However, as the car gains distance from the looming tree line, my eyes are involuntarily drawn back to the forest. Despite the safety of the car, an uneasy feeling gnaws at me. Those creatures, whatever they are, could be standing just beyond the first row of trees, their eyes tracking every inch the car moves. I shudder at the thought. The driver steps on the gas, and the car hums smoothly as we make our way down the road. While I'm not sure where we're headed, clarity dawns on me about one indisputable fact. I'm never returning to that cabin or the forest that surrounds it. Whatever waits in that darkness can keep it. I'm done. As the engine goes silent, the surrounding air is filled with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves. I step out of the car and stretch, taking in our new surroundings. The front yard is spacious, with a large oak tree offering shade. This tree is perfect for a swing, my younger brother Max points out, already picturing the fun times ahead. Dad unlocks the front door, revealing a spacious living room with wooden floors. The walls are decorated with ornate moldings, and large windows flood the space with light. Look at this fireplace, Mom says, her eyes scanning the intricately designed mantle. While they continue discussing potential arrangements for our furniture, Max tugs at my sleeve. Come on, he urges, pointing towards the staircase. We race up the steps, eager to claim our rooms. The second floor is lined with doors leading to different rooms. Max picks one with a window overlooking the backyard, and I choose the one next to his. After a quick exploration of our rooms, we venture down a hallway that leads to the back of the house. We discover a balcony with a view of the garden. It's lush with flowers and shrubs, and a stone path winds its way to a small pond. Bet there are frogs in there, Max says, already making plans to check it out later. Heading back inside, we rejoin our parents who are now in the kitchen. It's large with modern appliances and a center island. Dad is already envisioning family breakfasts here, and Mom is fascinated with the pantry's space. We made a good choice, Dad says, looking around with satisfaction. Then, Max and I decide to explore the ground level. The living room is large with a soft blue carpet and a fireplace in one corner. Next to it is the dining area with a long table and chairs. There are windows on one side, bringing in plenty of sunlight. Max is busy trying out each chair, ensuring they're comfortable, while I peek into the adjacent kitchen. Let's check out the backyard, Max suggests, spotting a sliding door in the kitchen. We step outside and are met with a modest garden filled with blooming flowers. There's a small shed in one corner and a pathway leading to it. We walk around, taking in the fresh air and the scent of roses. 
After a brief walk, we head back inside, eager to see the rest of the house. Climbing the stairs, we pass a family photo hanging on the wall. We then reach the hallway of the second floor once again. Doors line each side. Most are bedrooms, empty and waiting to be filled with our belongings. As we continue our exploration, we come across an old wooden door. It's different from the others. The handle is ornate, and despite my best efforts, the door remains shut. Max joins me, trying his luck, but it's clear the door is locked. Hey, Lisa, what's in there? Max asks, pressing his ear against the door. I shrug. I don't know, but it's locked. Let's find the key. We look around, thinking maybe the key is nearby, but our search yields nothing. We are all gathered at the dining table, plates filled with spaghetti and salad. The soft glow from the overhead chandelier makes the room cozy. Max is enthusiastically sharing details about the garden while Mom listens intently, already making plans for weekend gardening. The aroma of garlic bread fills the air, and the conversation is light and filled with laughter. Taking a deep breath, I steer the conversation towards our earlier discovery. Did the real estate agent mention a locked room upstairs? I ask. Mom pauses, her fork halfway to her mouth. She thinks for a moment before replying. No, she didn't. Maybe the key is around here somewhere. Dad, sipping his water, chimes in. I'll give her a call tomorrow. There must be a way to open it. Max looks puzzled. Why would they leave one room locked? It's weird. I nod in agreement. It's like they're hiding something. Mom tries to ease our curiosity. Maybe it's just storage or old stuff from the previous owner. Let's not jump to conclusions. After finishing our meal, we clear the table and wash the dishes. The mystery of the locked room lingers in our minds, turning our new home into an even more intriguing place. Our days are filled with routine tasks, but the evenings often revolve around discussions of the locked room. During dinner, Max often shares wild theories about what might be behind the door, while Mom reminds us to focus on settling into our new home. The room is a constant topic among our neighbors too, as word spreads about the mystery in our house. One Saturday, Dad gathers a box of tools, determined to unlock the door himself. However, despite his efforts, the door remains shut. The handle is old but sturdy, and no amount of jiggling or prodding seems to make a difference. Desperate for answers, we decide to consult a local historian, hoping they might have some information about the house and the elusive room. But the visit proves fruitless. The historian is intrigued, but admits he has no knowledge of any locked rooms in the houses of our area. The day Dad finally reaches the real estate agent, he puts her on speakerphone so we can all hear. I simply handed over all the keys that were given to me, she says, her voice apologetic. Max, not one to hide his frustration, asks, Didn't the previous owner say anything about it? She hesitates for a moment. He didn't mention any locked rooms, just said that everything is as it should be. We end the call, more puzzled than ever. The following week we're finally able to get a hold of the previous owner. We gather in the living room, the evening sun casting a warm glow through the windows. Mom holds the phone in her hand. Max and I sit on the couch, listening intently, while Dad stands by the fireplace, arms crossed. The house has been in my family for years, the previous owner continues, his voice raspy with age. My parents mentioned the room, but they too never had access. It's been a mystery for as long as I can remember. Dad asks, were there any rumors or stories about that room in the community? The elderly gentleman chuckles softly. Oh, many tales have been spun around that room. Some say it was a study, others believe it was a hidden treasure chamber, and a few even whispered about it being haunted. But they are all stories, nothing concrete. Mom, trying to find a practical solution, inquires, Is there any old key or any document that might help us? The owner thinks for a moment. I can't recall any specific key. As for documents, 
There might be some old papers in the attic. I left many things behind when I moved. Maybe they can offer some insight. Thanking him for his time, Mom ends the call. We sit in silence for a moment, absorbing the new information. The mystery of the locked room deepens, but now, with a potential lead in the attic, there is renewed hope of solving it. In the following week, Dad spends his evenings researching alternative methods to open old locked doors, while Mom consults with friends and neighbors for suggestions. Max and I can feel the mounting tension and our curiosity about the locked room grows with each passing day. It seems like the entire neighborhood is buzzing with speculations and theories about what lies behind that door. One afternoon, a group of our friends come over, eager to witness the spectacle for themselves. They gather around the door, throwing guesses and daring each other to try their hand at opening it. The next day, Dad announces that he has contacted a specialist who deals with old locks. The appointment is set for the coming Saturday. Finally, Saturday arrives. Max and I are upstairs, lost in a game, when we hear a series of clinking sounds coming from downstairs. We race down the stairs to find a locksmith kneeling in front of the door, with his assortment of tools spread out neatly on a cloth. Dad stands nearby, watching the locksmith's every move, while Mom is a few steps behind, with a worried expression on her face. After what feels like an eternity, the locksmith straightens up, wiping sweat from his brow. He turns to face Dad, shaking his head slowly. I'm sorry, Mr. Johnson, but this door... I can't figure it out. The room is silent, save for the soft ticking of the clock on the wall. Mom breaks the silence. Her voice is tinged with concern. Should we break it down? Dad rubs his chin, his face reflecting the inner turmoil of making a difficult decision. I don't want to risk any structural damage. Maybe there's another way. That evening, we gather around the dining table, brainstorming for solutions, refusing to give up. The locked room has united our family in an unexpected quest, turning our ordinary lives into an unfolding mystery, eagerly waiting to reveal its secrets. The door becomes an obsession, not just for our family, but for the entire neighborhood. Kids from down the street often stop by, their eyes wide with curiosity, asking about the infamous locked room. Some even bring their own makeshift lock-picking tools, eager to try their hand at unlocking it. Our house becomes the hub of many gatherings, with neighbors and friends frequently visiting, all drawn by the allure of the locked room. Most evenings are spent in the living room with cups of tea or coffee as everyone shares their theories. One particularly cold evening, Mrs. Wilson, our next-door neighbor, shares a tale from her youth about a similar locked room in a mansion two towns over. They never did manage to open it, she says, taking a slow sip of her tea. And when the mansion was demolished years later, the room was empty, nothing but dust. Mom looks thoughtful. It's intriguing to think of all the possibilities. What if there's something valuable inside, she murmurs, more to herself than anyone else. Dad chuckles softly. Or maybe it's just an old broom closet. The room's influence is undeniable. At night as I lie in bed, I sometimes hear the faintest of sounds coming from the direction of the door, a creak, or sometimes voices. But I can't tell if that's my imagination running wild, or if I'm really hearing things. The sun is barely up as I make my way to the kitchen for some breakfast. The house is quiet, with only the distant chirping of birds outside. As I pass the hallway leading to the locked room, Something on the floor catches my eye. I bend down and pick up a folded piece of paper. Unfolding it, my eyes skim over the words. Thank you for not letting them in. They are still here. What the hell could this mean? How did the note get there? Startled, my heart rate quickens. The note is written with neat, almost delicate handwriting. But the message it carries is anything but comforting. I clutch it in my hand, feeling the edges of the paper pressing into my skin. I hurry into the kitchen where Dad is seated at the table, engrossed in the morning newspaper. He glances up as I enter, noting my anxious expression. 
What is it? He asks, setting the paper aside. I hand him the note. His face becomes serious as he reads the message. Where did you find this? In the hallway, I reply. Right outside that door. He rubs his temples, taking a moment to collect his thoughts. We should tell your mother about this. Suddenly, Mom enters the kitchen, drawn by our hushed conversation. She is carrying a tray with steaming mugs of coffee. Setting the tray down, she asks, What's going on? Dad shows her the note, and I watch as her face mirrors the same shock and concern I felt earlier. The room is filled with tension, and the chirping of birds outside seems oddly out of place now. We need to figure out what's going on, Mom says, her voice firm. Over the next few days, a sense of unease permeates the house. It feels as though we're being watched, every move, every whisper. I often find myself stopping in my tracks, thinking I've heard a whisper or seen a shadow move out of the corner of my eye. One evening, as we gather for dinner, Mom mentions, Has anyone noticed the vase in the living room moving? Yesterday, it was by the window, and today, it's on the coffee table. Dad nods. I've heard footsteps late at night when everyone is asleep. And there's that cold spot near the staircase. Max chimes in. I thought I was imagining things, but my toys are constantly moved around. And I heard a lullaby coming from the locked room yesterday. I frown, trying to process everything. That's strange. I've felt like someone is watching me when I'm in the study, but every time I turn around, no one is there. We all exchange uneasy glances, realizing that these aren't isolated incidents. The house, with its creaky floorboards and old architecture, always had an air of mystery. But now, it feels like it's coming alive in ways we never anticipated. Mom takes a deep breath. We need to address this. I don't want our home to be a place where we are constantly on edge. Max, with his wide eyes, looks around the table. Do you think the locked room has something to do with all this? Maybe the note was a warning? I nod in agreement. It does seem like everything started escalating after I found that note. Dad suggests, let's set up a camera outside that door. If there's something going on, we need evidence. It'll also help us understand if this is something real or just our minds playing tricks on us. Mom agrees. That's a good idea. At least we'll have some answers. With our plan in place, the mood at the dinner table lightens a bit, but the undercurrent of unease remains. The evening sun casts long shadows in the hallway as Dad returns from the store and unpacks a new security camera from its box. He has chosen a model with night vision capabilities, ensuring that even in the darkest hours, it captures clear footage. As he sets up the camera on a tripod, ensuring it's level with the locked door, I can't help but ask, Do you really think this will catch anything, Dad? He pauses, adjusting the angle of the lens slightly. I don't know, but it's worth a shot. At the very least, we'll know if it's something real causing these disturbances, or if it's all in our heads. I watch as he connects the camera to his phone, ensuring he can monitor the footage remotely. The soft blue light on the camera glows, indicating it's now recording. He takes a step back, inspecting his setup. There, he says, satisfied. Now, if anything comes out of that room or tries to get in, we'll know. Later that night, we all gather in the living room. Dad has connected his phone to the TV, allowing us to view the camera feed on a larger screen. We sit, watching intently, the only sound in the room being the occasional rustling as one of us moves in our seats. Hours seem to pass, and while there's an underlying tension, nothing out of the ordinary happens. Max, draped over the armrest of the couch, is the first to doze off. Mom wraps a blanket around him, whispering, maybe this was a waste of time. Perhaps we're just imagining things. I'm about to agree when suddenly a faint shadow appears at the edge of the camera frame. It's subtle, almost mist-like, but it's moving. The shadow, formless at first, starts to gain a more distinct shape as it slowly moves closer to the door. It's not human, 
but it's not entirely abstract either. It seems to hover for a moment before the door, then, as if being absorbed, it disappears into it. We sit in stunned silence. Dad finally breaks the quiet. Did... Did everyone see that? Mom nods, her face pale. What was that? I don't know, I reply, my voice shaky. But it came from the room. A few days later on a stormy night, the air in the house is thick with tension. The consistent rhythm of the raindrops adds a sense of urgency to the atmosphere. With every rumble of thunder, the wooden floorboards beneath our feet seem to shudder in response. Mom is in the kitchen, brewing a pot of chamomile tea, hoping it will soothe our nerves. She looks up as another bright lightning bolt splits the night and illuminates the kitchen. Dad is in the living room, engrossed in a book, but I can tell he's just trying to distract himself from the events unfolding in our home. Suddenly, the house is filled with the sound of Max's footsteps. They are slow and deliberate. I leave my spot at the top of the stairs and follow him, watching as he makes his way to the locked room. His face is expressionless, and his movements are mechanical. As he nears the door, I notice his hand reaching out, almost as if he expects the door to welcome him in. Max! I call out hoping to snap him out of this trance. My feet pound on the wooden floorboards as I dash towards him, but as I stretch my hand out, fingers inches away from his pajama sleeve, the locked room's door groans softly and slowly swings open. An unexpected bluish glow spills out, casting a surreal light across the hallway. Frozen in my tracks, I watch Max step into the room, as if being pulled by an unseen force. Behind me, I hear the hurried footsteps of Mom and Dad. Their breathless voices fill the corridor, filled with confusion and fear. Lisa, is he... Dad's voice trails off as he arrives beside me, his gaze fixed on the open doorway. Mom reaches us, her eyes darting between the room and Max. How did that door open? She questions, her voice barely above a whisper. I can't find the words to answer. The scene in front of us defies logic. The room's interior is bathed in that ghostly light, contrasting sharply with the turbulent storm outside the lone window. As I step through the doorway, an immediate chill envelops me, contrasting sharply with the warmth of the rest of the house. Straight ahead, a window is slightly open, allowing the sound of the pounding rain to seep in and making the sheer curtains flutter gently. The wallpaper is faded with age its edges curling and peeling away in places, revealing glimpses of bare old wood beneath. The floor beneath my feet is a dusty carpet, aged and worn, with patterns that are hard to distinguish due to years of use and neglect. To my left, a wooden shelf leans slightly, burdened with old books. The right side of the room is what truly captures my attention. Old toys are spread out, some neatly placed on a wooden table, while others are scattered haphazardly on the floor. Dolls with once rosy cheeks now have porcelain faces dulled by time. A wooden train set, its tracks slightly warped, sits as if frozen in play. Along the walls, framed sketches depict children in various activities, running, playing, and laughing. Look at this. Dad's voice carries a hint of unease as he holds up a drawing for us to see. The paper is worn, and the edges are frayed. The colors, though faded, reveal a simple crayon sketch of a family. Two adults stand behind two children, each with smiles. But the unsettling part of the drawing is not the family. Behind them, almost blending into the background, are shadowy figures. They aren't clearly defined, but their presence is ominous. That's... odd. I murmur, squinting to get a clearer look at the figures. They appear faceless, with a hazy form that makes it impossible to discern any features. Mom's face is pale, her eyes darting around the room. Her breath is visible in the cold air, and she hugs herself, trying to find warmth. This place doesn't feel right, she whispers. We need to get Max and get out of here. Max stands still, mesmerized by the toys scattered around. Gently, I approach him and take his hand, feeling his cold fingers. Come on, buddy, 
I say, giving his hand a reassuring squeeze. But as we all move towards the exit, a gust of wind sweeps through the room, extinguishing the little light that was coming through the window and closing it. And then, with a loud bang, the door slams shut. We're plunged into an oppressive darkness, the kind that feels heavy and suffocating. Dad rushes to the door, his hands desperately searching for a handle, a knob, or anything. But his efforts are in vain. It's like the door has vanished, he says, his voice shaky. We huddle together, trying to find comfort in each other's presence. The reality is sinking in. We are trapped, with no clear way out. Try the window. My voice barely pierces the deafening sound of the storm outside. The rain pelts against the glass in a furious rhythm, mirroring the frantic beating of my heart. Dad's hands grip the window's edge, his fingers white with strain. He pushes and pulls, but the window remains steadfast, refusing to budge. Frost creeps over the glass, obscuring our view of the outside world. The cold seems to seep into our bones, making every movement sluggish. Mom's eyes dart around the room, searching for another escape route. We have to stay calm, she urges, though the tremor in her voice betrays her fear. Panicking won't help. There's got to be another way. Max's grip on my arm tightens. His eyes, wide and filled with tears, meet mine. I'm scared, Lisa. I pull him close, trying to shield him from the room's suffocating atmosphere. It's okay, Max, I say, striving to sound confident. We'll figure this out. Shadows dance across the walls, and every so often, I catch a glimpse of figures lurking just at the edge of my vision. They are indistinct, darting between the gloom and the weak light coming from the window. I begin to hear faint whispering. I strain my ears, and after a moment, the whispers become discernible. A multitude of voices layered over each other, each recounting their own moment of entering the room, their own mistake, their own entrapment. But one phrase is repeated. Don't let them in. Suddenly, it clicks. The note. It wasn't a warning of the dangers from outside, but a plea to prevent others from entering this room. Every soul in this room made the same mistake we did, and now they're trapped, their essences absorbed and held captive. The room doesn't just hold memories, it feeds on the living, absorbing their life force and adding to its collection of souls. The shadowy figures aren't just remnants of past tragedies, they are the restless spirits of those consumed before, and they want out. But to do so, they need to trap fresh souls in their place. As this realization sinks in, the room seems to come alive. The whispering grows louder, the walls seem to close in, and the dim light flickers. The shadowy figures become more solid, their forms twisted with malice. Their gaze is fixated on us, or more precisely, on the door that stands between freedom and eternal entrapment. Dad's voice, filled with dread, breaks through the escalating noise. The door! We need to get out! But when he tries to open it, the door doesn't budge. The whispers become gleeful, triumphant. Mom's eyes are filled with tears as she clutches both me and Max close. We should have listened, she chokes out. The truth is inescapable. We're the latest victims, destined to become another set of shadows lurking in the periphery, awaiting the next unsuspecting souls to warn, to frighten, but most importantly, to replace. The chilling reality settles in. We are now the ones who are still here.